Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. So today we have Shane Buell coming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. Actually, before we start, um, I'm going to pass it over to Shane for the uh, Bipcot message. As always, this show is covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents or affiliates thereof. To learn more about this, go to Bipcot.org. Awesome. See, J- Jeremy always hassles me you know, on the show and the seeds of liberty because I messed that up, but awesome. <laughs> so he's coming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. He's a volunteerist, agorist, and individualist, and he's the admin on a few Facebook pages, including the Pullout Method, the Iconoclast, Autonomous, Anarcho Consciousness, Psychologic Anarchist, Living in Modern Times, Anarchy is for Lovers, counter-establishment economics, self-ownership, and non-aggression principle. And you can find him on Facebook uh, under his name, Shane Buell, B-U-E-L-L. And we're going to talk a little bit about his history, how he came to volunteerism, what um, you know, books and podcasts uh, influenced him along the way, and also about um, you know, relationalism and compassion and anarchy, um, because that is, uh, you know, that's that's more of Sterling Luhan's style, and I really I do identify with that much more as well, and uh, and also perhaps some of his pages that uh, that he likes that he feels more um, close to, is closer to his heart. Anarcho consciousness, psychologic anarchist, uh, pull out method, and his very new one, autonomous. So um, Shane, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, no problem. We uh, we've been Facebook friends for a while, and uh, I think you came on to see Liberty a while ago, and we got to talk a little bit there. That was pretty cool. Um, and it's always nice to uh, have these conversations with people on Facebook that you're talking to through like you know texting and chatting. But it's been a little bit different when you're <laughs> talking to them face to face like this. So uh, yeah, so I love it. Yeah. Uh, Seeds of Liberty was kind of a big influence on me, and uh, I've been on there a couple times now. The first time was to kind of be uh, give my testament of how much of an influence they were on me. And you happened to not be there that week, I think. So, uh, or no, I think you were. Yeah, yeah. The, the first week I was there. But then my second time on, you weren't there. And so uh, this is actually great to get a chance to talk to you one-on-one because you, after all, were my red pill to anarchy. Uh, wow. I believe at the time when I first uh, friended you, I don't know if you friended me or if I friended you, but it was right around the time that I first heard of anarchy and looked into it but uh you were my first anarchist friend wow and uh, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah you were my first one and now i've got over uh, a thousand anarchist friends know, isn't it amazing <laughs> and probably a hundred that are on the fence you know <laughs> so oh on the fence i thought you said on the fe- yeah. feds the feds list. oh no 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 <laughs> well there's probably a few we're, we're probably all too. on the feds list that's okay <laughs> there's probably a few of those too <laughs> yeah. but um yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, I, I started a, lo- a long time ago. I had about three or four, maybe 500 just anarchist friends on Facebook. And I didn't really accept friend requests from people who weren't necessarily anarchists. I would check out their, their profiles. But now I'm kind of, you know, opening up and like friending a lot more different types of crowds like conspiracy theorists and truthers and, you know, the, the spiritual community. And they're all kind of clashing on the newsfeed a little bit, <laughs> but they learn from each other even when I'm not there, you know? So like, I'll come back and I'll notice that someone who was like a Hillary fan who I friended a Hillary, uh, friend supporter who went from Hillary to Stein to Johnson to anarchist, mm-hmm. like in a matter of, I don't know. Cause you remember when Bernie first, uh, publicly gave his support to Hillary. Right. 
all the Bernie supporters were kind of jaded at that point. Yeah. And a lot of people had said, hey, this is our chance to win over a lot of Bernie supporters. And uh, I met one of them in real life who is now now identifies as an anarchist. Wow. And, uh, I met one online who was a real big Hillary supporter who actually went the entire route in about six weeks instead hmm. of six months. Whoa. <laughs> so that was really impressive. And a lot of that happened without me even really being at the keyboard mm. because uh, a lot of stuff I might have liked when I was away on my mobile or something will show up in their feeds and then they might comment on something. And then you know how anarchists are. If, mm -hmm. if there's, they see something wrong with a comment, they'll jump <laughs> in. And so um, I would come back and see all of this discussion that took place and they would win over people without me even being there. You know. Right. So I think that's really nice to see how the progression – that a lot of people from different groups can come to anarchy. Yeah, you know, it's um yeah, it's it's awesome Facebook, you know, because it's such a great networking tool and I, I know a lot of people don't like it because it's um, you know, like what the um Mark Zuckerberg, you know, has some kind of ties with I don't know, CIA or the FBI and sharing information, they can see everything. And at one point I was uh, of the mindset, you know, when I was learning about this stuff, like, oh, man, you know, they can track everything. They can listen to our phone calls. They can they can uh, view our text messages, read our emails, and they can turn on your microphone when even if your phone's off and listen to your conversations. And um, and at one point, you know, I'm like, shoot, what am I going to do? I got to, you know, put a piece of tape over my uh, <laughs> over my camera, my laptop. I got to I was using this this um, I don't know if you know the search engine called Start Page. Have you heard about that? It's no. uh, all, you know, alternative to Google, and it's like completely like safe. They don't store any cookies. They, um, you know, after you use it, it's an app. You know, after you use it, all the searches completely erase and restart over. Nothing gets saved, and and so I was using that for a while, and then after a while, I'm just like, you know, it doesn't even matter anymore. You know, if if you know, like like Larkin Rose, the way he puts it is like, I want government agents to read my stuff <laughs> he's like i was like i wonder how many government agents i converted just by them <laughs> reading my stuff <laughs> you know and so i really stopped caring and i'm like i'm like hey put everything out now I'm, everything is out there like you know you can read anything of what i've said and what i've written mm -hmm. and i think it's more powerful that we speak from conviction and that we're not cowering in the shadows and trembling because of what somebody in power might have heard, and uh, and I think that's a that's a stance that um, a lot of us need to take more of, right? Go ahead. I agree. Um, I actually came to anarchy from the whole truther conspiracy theorist movement, and so there was a lot of built up paranoia that right. I brought with me. Mm -hmm. And for the first year or so of identifying as an anarchist, I was still not accepting any friend requests that weren't like obviously real anarchists, and I still wouldn't even share anything publicly, hardly ever, you know, but now everything I share is public, all the friends, all the family, they all get to see that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, it's probably about, um, a year ago, well, maybe two now, but it was a year ago when I got in my accident, I decided to really start branching out and connecting with the anarchist community. And I started sharing publicly and accepting all the friend requests, you know, cause I just wasn't scared anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. I, I like. Uh, I remember there was one. There was one uh, post somebody did, and and they were asking. Um, you know, what is your requirements for accepting a friend request? And some people were like, you know, fifty mutual friends, thirty mutual friends, twenty, ten, right? And uh, and Luis Misi I, 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 I'll never forget what he said. He's like, I don't have any requirements. I'm easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love Luis Fernando Mises. He's uh, the Emancipated Human is one of my favorite pages, and yeah. if I could ever admin one more page, it would probably be that one. <laughs> but I just probably don't have the time for it. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. Um, I love his style. He's he's really open. He's he's gentle. He's sensitive. He's relaxed. He keeps it humorous, which is very important. You know the way he writes and talks. Uh, he keeps it real. And uh, and I try to I try to use that in my show as well. You know, when I talk to people, I think it's so important that we um, use humor in what we do and not get too serious about this stuff. You know, because 
you know, in the end, you know, we should be enjoying life and teaching people that, you know, that's why we love freedom we, and we love uh, liberty is because you can enjoy life more, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're angry at someone for believing a certain thing, you know, that's not going to present well for the philosophy that you're trying to describe. Right. And ultimately, you know, we control our reactions to things, including our emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't just need to automatically react to a stimulus in a in a pre-programmed or predictable way. We need to like pause and think about, well, is there a better course of action or, you know, why am I reacting this way? And you can kind of diffuse a lot of reactions that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, So so. So I know you mentioned you mentioned my show, or or is it what I was posting on Facebook? That's what you were seeing. All right. Um, well, back when I was a ba- fresh baby anarchist, <laughs> uh, uh, this guy Danilo, he was sharing all kinds of really radical stuff, and I thought I was in the liberty, you know, because I, you know, I used to listen to Alex Jones, and he got me into the Ron Paul thing, and right, Ron right. Paul got me to see it from the inside how corrupt it really is. Because uh, I was a delegate for Ron Paul in 2008, uh-huh. right? and then again in 2012, but yeah, it was obvious at that point. So anyway, uh, I came to – long story short, me and Danilo became friends, and I thought my stuff was radical, but a lot of stuff you were sharing on Facebook was way more radical. <laughs> And so, but it really all made sense. You know, I ultimately, I'm a person of logic and logic is probably what will ultimately win me over the most. And the philosophy of liberty has that, you know, it's consistently logical and and ethical and moral and and all of that, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is much better than what I was into at the time, which was minarchism, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, and what about any books or authors that that you've read that, that have influenced you? Well, I did read a lot of Ron Paul, and Ron Paul, uh, he he read a lot of economists like Milton Friedman and stuff, but he also recommended Mises, right? Mm. So then I got on Mises.org, and I discovered uh, Hayek and Rothbard and, and, and a little bit of Basiat, you know, and I was like, okay, well, this is making a lot more sense to me now. Um, but then once I got to... Uh, the New Libertarian Manifesto by Samuel Edward Konkin. See, Rothbard, I think, had it pretty close to right, but Konkin just blew me away. Hmm. Like, yeah. So uh, those are some of my favorites, actually. C- can you go into a little bit of what Konkin said? Because I have not read that. And uh, I-, I remember Derek Bros. I was talking to him, and he-, he was saying that that influenced him a lot as well. Yeah, um, I'm one of the I'm the type that hardly ever finishes a book, but like it seems <laughs> like I somehow find some of the better parts of any, any book that I pick up. Uh-huh. And uh, Samuel Edward Konkin, uh, he wrote uh, the New Libertarian Manifesto, which is basically about agorism and counter-economics. And um, I wish I had like a, a handy quote that Benjamin always links. Um, but it's it's really about, you know, I can't quote him exactly, so I'll paraphrase. Uh, the free market and an uh, underground economy, uh, starving the state and becoming like um, – you can replace anything that the state has a monopoly of force on uh, can be competed out of business, basically. Right. Uh, and uh, I I really wish I had this really good conk and quote handy, but I don't. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to you know, paraphrase when I say feed the market, starve the state. Right. And uh, that's one thing I kind of mention a lot on the pullout method. Uh, the pullout method is uh, was created by Mandy Silver, and I help admin that page. And it's kind of like it's about agorism, but I, I say instead of smashing the state or changing it from the inside, we can use the free market to avoid the state and go around it. And um, the free market, like in a lot of cases, like when it comes to security or who will build the roads, the free market has those solutions, and they're probably already being used somewhere if we just you know look hard enough to find out where this is going on, like cell four one one is a is a big thing like i think it should be a lot bigger um we can build on that you know yeah 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 the uh you know the the it's it's interesting the terminology that we use to describe what we do um like some people say i want to abolish the state right or abolish mm-hmm. government um right. or well, like you said smash the state um and i just don't see it like that statism is a state of mind right mm-hmm. so the state is really 
Um, it's just men and women, as Mark Stevens says, men and women with guns forcing you to pay them. That's it. Men and women who believe that they have an exemption from the universal laws of morality that we are all subject to. And I think when we begin to apply morality to everyone without exception, there is no way that the state can exist at all. And and so you don't have to abolish anything. <laughs> the way Larkin Rose says it, it's like it's like we must abolish Santa Claus. We must abolish the Easter Bunny, but it doesn't exist for the, in the first place. Oh, <laughs> right. It's like it's like if somebody says we should abolish Santa Claus, and somebody's like, well, how are we gonna how are the kids gonna get presents? <laughs> you know. So there's nothing to abolish. All right. It's just it's just these people that we think after they go through these these magical rituals, they all of a sudden have the right to steal and call taxation or to kidnap and call the war on drugs or to murder people in foreign lands and call the war on terror, right? It's still the same actions, but with people with special costumes and badges. And we think that they're special people that have special immunities towards all these, you know, universal laws. I think it is attractive to more people is instead of um, you know, people are always criticizing anarchists, I think, for saying, you know, you people just want to tear everything down. You want to tear down the system and all the structure and the public schools and the tax system, everything. You want to tear it all down. Um, but what are you going to replace it with? Right. W w mm -hmm. What are your solutions? I know what you hate, but what do you like? So that's why it's important for us to to say what we love. We love peace, freedom, um, compassion, kindness. You know, we're gentle people, you know. Um, you know, we, we, <laughs> there is no such thing as coerced compassion as in the welfare state, right? If you, you either give or you don't give, but if you're forced to give, that's not called compassion. That's just called coercion. <laughs> right. Yeah. As, uh, as far as the whole abolish thing goes, let's see, like I think of abolish as to make illegal or to, so if you made government illegal, like there ought to be a law that there should be no laws, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, I saw a meme recently. Uh, that kind of summed it up really well uh, that when someone says um, they want to abolish government and how will they do it, you know, um, the response to that question was something like um, the same way we abolished Blockbuster Video. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically, the free market just came along and made it obsolete, exactly. you know, and that's exactly. how we have Netflix now. Exactly. And uh, so there's going to if the free market is allowed to function, I think a lot of stuff will come along and replace the monopolized services the government, you know, has right now. And as far as these men and women with uh, the belief in authority, like uh, there are those who believe they have authority, which was granted to them by those who may or may not have even consented to it. Mm -hmm. And then there's those of us who buy into that belief. And so it's the belief in illegitimate authority, I think, that perpetuates a lot of that myth of those who have it and those who must somehow must follow it. You know, some people feel compelled to comply mm. and uh, I don't buy into that. And I don't have uh, the fear of authority either. I think the fear of and the belief in authority are two of the big hurdles that you can get over rather quickly. And everything else is kind of small stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting argument you remind me of was, um, when uh, you know, when you talk, when we talk about anarchism and people are like, Oh, that's, that's all nice. Um, but you know, there's always going to be somebody in control and, you know, there's always going to be somebody in power. It doesn't matter if you're an anarchist or, or what, you know. So, <laughs> so, so basically they're taken for granted that there's these power structures, right? The state where pe somebody can just hold the reins of power. And so I think the idea to consider is what is power? Where does power originate, right? Is it really on the throne, you know, going through these magical rituals? Is that where power originates? No, I think power originates from the people who believe that they are in power. <laughs> they give, just like you said, they grant them this authority over us mere mortals, <laughs> regular individuals uh, who don't have that exemption. So, um, you know, this, the, the people in the military who, you know, believe that they must obey orders regardless if it conflicts with their own morality. Same thing with law enforcement. They believe they must obey orders regardless of the, you know, the morality of the laws. So that's, you know, where power originates. It originates in the people. They create these monsters that we're all taught to fear you know it's like it's like hitler killed all killed six million jews no he didn't no it was the didn't. order followers that killed right <laughs> hitler exactly. killed a few maybe yeah it's the order follower who's responsible and culpable for their own actions not the order giver and if it wasn't for this belief in illegitimate authority the order followers need not comply and right. they would they would know that you know mm -hmm. so which is which is basically the fundamental theme of your pullout method uh page right well, yeah, the pull-out method is uh, basically about not 
complying, uh, you know, and finding the alternatives. It's, you know, agorism, so, but so not basically, necessarily. So basically you're saying it's not an anti-fertility method, right? No, it is not that. <laughs> nice. Also an anti-fertility. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, the pull-out method is more about uh, agorist uh, practices and principles and sometimes, you know, just perspectives, you know. Um, I haven't been uh, you know, active with it lately. Maybe Mandy has, but pretty soon here, now that Mercury retrogrades over, mm-hmm. I don't know if you know about that. It's an <laughs> astrological phenomenon. Right, right, right. But anyway, now that that's over, um, I should be able to have the time, energy, and focus to get back to you know doing the things I plan to do with social media. Yeah, actually, that that brings up another point. Um, so you uh, focus more on you know with your anarchism. And your volunteerism, you focus more on the psychological, the spiritual aspect of it. So how do you see that as it relates to anarchism in your mind? All right. Well, I kind of came to the liberty movement um, from uh, a strange direction. Uh, I used to be a conspiracy theorist, truther, and I was really into spirituality and stuff. Um, And I always thought that, you know, freedom or liberty was like a spiritual thing as long as we were free in our spirit you know then we could be free in every other way but i also studied psychology in in college and i learned that you know well there's a lot of ways to be manipulated there and ways that we could work our way out of this mental cage that we put ourselves in with our thinking and then uh when i found you know uh, anarchy and philosophy. Philosophy gave me a kind of moral compass that I never knew existed. And when you combine that with psychology and spirituality, it's just kind of, um, it's really synergistic. And so I think that you almost need to combine the three to, to be truly free in body, mind, and spirit. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of anarchists who, they don't, and, I, and it's okay that they're not really open to subtle things, and uh, I'm fine with that. But uh, I think there's a lot of overlap between the different communities, and so the different activist spheres of influence, I think, can kind of unify a little bit uh, with what they have in common instead of nitpicking over, you know, the things they disagree on. So when it comes to uh, compassionate anarchy and relationalism, um, I. These are some ideas that I had like a long time ago, but never really put into words. And then when Sterling Luhan came along, I was like, this is exactly what I've been thinking, but haven't actually said. (laughs) And so um, relationalism is all about relating to the other person's point of view. And we all come from somewhere. And if we came from, say, that direction, then we can truly relate to where they're coming from and um, meet them in the middle in a sort of in a way. And so we don't necessarily debate to try to win arguments. We debate to try to communicate like our position, but in the process of doing so, we should also understand their position. And once you know you do that, you kind of disarm any of the uh, the reactions that people tend to have when it comes to anarchy. Uh, so that way, you don't trigger their feels or rustle their jimmies, <laughs> and you can actually have a heart to heart conversation with somebody and plant that seed of thought that will eventually lead them on their own path to discovering liberty and freedom. Yes, definitely. That's, um, it's definitely the, the method that I, uh, have been using. And, and when I met Sterling, I was, uh, it was awesome to see that, you know, he was promoting a similar method of, um, you know, trying to talk to somebody and diffuse their emotional tension. Um, and you know, when I tell people, you know, most of the people that I meet are, are homeschooling parents cause I, you know, I'm with my kids, you know, we go out to different events and groups and, uh, classes. And so I meet various parents. And so, you know, so they're already skeptical of this, of, of, uh, government schools. So it's, I have a little bit of an advantage there. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's kind of easy to just give them that little extra push, <laughs> you know, I'm like, if you don't think the government can do schools, right? What else do you think <laughs> they can't do? So, uh, yeah, so I use that a lot. Um, and, and I try to back into my, you know, the name of my, my website and podcast. So I kind of tell them, they, they ask me, so what do you talk about on your website? I'm like, oh, well, I talk about, um, morality and I talk about volunteerism, this philosophy called volunteerism and agorism and homeschooling and peaceful parenting and attachment parenting and unschooling. 
and uh, precious metals, the, the monetary system, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> so most of the time, I don't even mention anarchy. And then, and then they ask more, and then I'm like, well, what's voluntarism? Well, just advocating for voluntary interaction between peaceful people. Like, do you advocate that? Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> and kind of backing into the idea of anarchy. And yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, well, I've read uh, and lo- watched some of your other videos where you've had conversations with people, and uh, had you heard you talk about like people who aren't necessarily anarchists or have never even been exposed to the philosophy or anything. Um, some of the words come with like baggage uh, that has been placed there by the media mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I like how you come up with different words for it, like independent free thinkers and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, because you might run into somebody who really truly is an independent free thinker who just hasn't been exposed to this yet, yeah. you know, or thought of it in these terms. Yeah, yeah, and um, and you know, I don't like to look at a debate as you know, I won and you lost. You know, that's not a proper way of looking at a debate. I think I think it, it should be a conversation, transmission of ideas, and exchange of ideas uh, peacefully. You know, without any insults or attacks or slander. Um, you know, and uh, and basically, you know, in any conversation, uh, whoever gets emotional and insulted and slanderous um, is the loser and should exit <laughs> quickly and immediately uh, if anything but um, yeah so I'm really um, I, I really I really try to you know you know take a deep breath calm down and just take it step by step very simple and uh, and I remember um, I was talking to one uh, and I guess recently uh, Melissa uh, Rakovic you, you might know her <laughs> um, and she was saying something interesting that um um, she's like, you know, this taxation is theft argument, it's just so old. I'm, I'm like, I'm done with it. I can't talk about it anymore. Um, I want to move on to bigger and better things. Like, like more important things, like how about drone strikes, you know, in the Middle East that are killing people every day? You know, what about that? Isn't that more important to talk about than taxation is theft? But, and it is, but, but really, if we really want to, um, disentangle the statism in their minds we first have to establish basics and taxation is theft is a basis a very basic concept that pretty much diffuses the entire notion of a government right how can anything be legitimate if it's based on theft and it can't (laughs) you know right and to go back to what melissa was talking about uh, with drone strikes i would say that's the initiation of aggression which is another basic core principle of the libertarian philosophy and the voluntary right. philosophy, right. the non-aggression principle. It's like the golden rule yeah. of philosophy. Right. And uh, she's got a really good point there. If people understood the initiation of aggression better, they would understand drone strikes better. Well, the other reason I wouldn't want to talk about drone strikes with people or bring it up is because that's, um, you know, like I can imagine somebody saying, well, you know, they did this to us so we're just fighting back or, you know, they look what they're doing in the Middle East and ISIS and they're beheading people and they're evil people. Don't you think we should help those people? And so it just starts, it just starts a whole back and forth where it's like, I don't know, it's like my facts against your facts. So I, so as much as possible, I try to stay away from like um, real life as much as possible. I try to maintain mm-hmm. conversation in the philosophical realm in the conceptual realm right just understand the ideas of voluntarism we can apply it to reality that's good too but first you got to understand where we're coming from the the ideas um and after you do that then everything else basically just falls into place you know so i think i think if we go to reality immediately um they can come up with all of these excuses and justifications for why things are happening the way they're happening you know what i mean so so that's that's a major reason why i don't I don't really talk about history either because everybody's got their own version of history. They, you know, they read this history book and that history book, and like, who's to say my history book is better than your history book, <laughs> right? So I think it's so important for me anyway that I focus on the philosophical realm, and that's really my strength. So, yeah, uh, well, like you said, taxation is theft. That's one of those like kind of basic axioms yeah. of the our understanding that we try to get across to people, and yeah. that was a really good viral meme campaign a while back. Right. It, it took off and caught a lot more steam than I thought it would. Yeah. And so, yeah, things like taxation is theft, conscription is slavery, war is mass murder. Yeah. Those are kind of like really simple axioms that I sometimes put in like hashtags and stuff on the things I share. Right. And and a lot of people do see them and it might plant that seed of thought and they'll think about it later. But uh, you know, I've also gotten negative reactions to stuff like that because uh, people say, oh, they're just contrived platitudes. And I'm thinking, well, they're more like spontaneous axioms that, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you apply them to the real world, they turn out to be true. 
Yeah. And, and the other thing that's difficult for us, uh, you know, as people who try to spread ideas and start conversations is that, you know, we have had these conversations with so many people in the past. So it's kind of like um, a teacher that has taught a class, you know, let's say for a whole semester. And they're like, all right, I taught this whole subject. They know it. Good. Mm-hmm. Now the next semester comes, you got to go all the way back from the beginning <laughs> And teach from the beginning. So every new person, you got to go back to the basics, the beginning. All right, you can never start from where you left off and get more complex. You know, and that's the frustrating every, part, I think. Yeah, every six months there's like a new wave of fresh baby anarchists. <laughs> They're ready to learn it all over again, and that's when we get to hear all over again. What yeah. about the roads and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I think you know the basics, the principles. It's so important that we uh, communicate those well, get those down, be calm and collected when we talk to people, and uh, and not uh, you know not attack them. Just kind of probe the mind, you know, to see why why are you thinking the way you're thinking, you know, what got you thinking, why you know does it make sense, is it logical, are you are you thinking like that because you understand it or because uh, somebody told you to think that way, <laughs> you know, or that's what your government school teacher told you to do, you know, which mm-hmm. most of the time pre-programmed. Is- pre-programmed reactions and that's why you know unschooling is is a really Im- important thing but also like adults need to kind of like decondition themselves every so often you know of any kind of programming that might get in there right 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 so so tell me about, a little bit about your your new page um autonomous and uh, All right. and, and what that's about and why you why you created it okay well i created a new page uh called autonomous which basically seeks to, you know, free the mind, body, and spirit of individuals everywhere. And I think that the philosophy has a really good grasp on the physical aspects of things, and psychology has a really good grasp on the mental aspects of things. And I come at it from this, you know, spiritual angle originally, and there's a lot of overlap between those different communities. So within the different activist spheres, there's a whole lot that they have in common. And I call it autonomous as kind of a play off of anonymous, which, you know, I, you know, used to not be a part of that, but, you know, I used to identify with it, I guess, to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. I used to have my profile picture as the Guy Fox mask, you know, but uh, I, I've seen a lot of stuff that they've done recently that I don't agree with. But basically, Autonomous is just a play off of that name, Anonymous, and I kind of want to identify on the more compassionate, philosophical aspects of anarchy, and then also um, psychological things, um, there's a lot of different psychological techniques we can use, and I know uh, Sterling Lujan is a lot more familiar with this, but uh, like cognitive reframing, uh, hypnotism, there's all kinds of ways that we can gain more conscious control over our subconscious processes. And then um, spirituality is something I've kind of been into for a long time. I've always done meditation and yoga. Um, I combine Kriya Yoga with Pranayama meditation. It has a lot of visualization to it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of overlap between those different communities. It may not be all anarchists will identify this and may not be all psychologists will identify with the stuff that me and Sterling talk about. And the spirituality you know, community, the spiritual community, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're, they're all over the place. You know, Everything from new age to this or that. Um, so I'm kind of trying to just kind of create a sphere – where they can all kind of participate. And uh, that's what the autonomous is about. Uh, I'm going to be posting all kinds of stuff that kind of brings all three of those aspects together. And I also have um, a page, or a group actually, called uh, Philosophy, Spirituality, and Anarchy, where there's a lot of uh, people from the different communities interacting with each other. And I think that you know, the anarchists have a lot to teach the, the psychological and spiritual communities, but they also have a lot to teach you know, the anarchists as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's really great to see a lot of that going on, where an anarchist kind of wakes up and starts noticing the more subtle aspects of life you know, that they might have overlooked before, because it's the kind of thing that, um, I don't mean to be solipsist or nihilist about it, but sometimes spiritual experiences are the kind of thing that people just have to have for themselves. There's like a quote that says the difference between religion and spirituality is that religion is believing in someone else's experience, but spirituality is having your own. And sometimes people just have to have their own version of that experience to to be able to, you know, put some faith in it. And so, uh, you know, I think that there is a lot of room within logic and within the, the hard 
logic brain to accept more subtle spiritual things. And I think there's always uh, like a scientific explanation for everything. We just might not know what that is yet. Cool. Yeah. What what, what brought to mind was, um, you know, how some people talking about dif the difference between religion and spirituality. You know, Luis Mises uh, talks a little bit about that, as well as um, you know, thinking about a lot of the um, Christian anarchists, which which uh, you know, I think. I understand that a lot of anarchists think that's a contradiction, like being in the Christian anarchist, you know, um, but uh, it's not. And um, and I think there's a lot of um, more, how do you say, consistent, you know, in terms of principle, uh, there's a lot more consistent um, Christian anarchists than there are atheist uh, you know, uh, or sorry, yeah, atheist statist, right? So, so I would prefer to have a Christian anarchist than an atheist statist, right? Because at least... Um, you know, the, the, the Christian will not use the state to impose his or her beliefs onto me, right? So it's beautiful that as an anarchist, you know, we can say that, uh, you know, you can have your different beliefs and I'm not going to try to impose them upon you. And I think that's a beautiful thing um, that uh, that people, I think, that people need to understand because, um, you know, that's that's basically what the state is. You know, it's like it's like I have my beliefs. And, you know, we all vote and I'm going to try to <laughs> use the state to impose them upon you and you're going to try to use them to force them, uh, impose them upon me. And let's see who wins. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just a violent, it's just a violent act. And uh, and it's just, um, yeah, it's it's no good. It's, you know, that's not how civilized people act. So I've, I've really I've interviewed a lot of of Christian anarchists and they're, you know, wonderful people, really intelligent, smart. And uh, and so I. I uh, have come to embrace that, even though I wasn't raised religious. I don't, I don't call myself a religious person. I, I call myself a spiritual person. I've, you know, studied a lot of world religions. Um, but, um, but yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to say that, <laughs> you know, Christian anarchist, awesome. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, statism itself is a religion. Oh, well, that's and true it's perhaps, too. Right. And it's perhaps the most dangerous. Right. Religion. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, its proponents are the most zealous, I think of all religions. Yes. Yes. There's, yes. You can sometimes hear the zeal uh, in, in, in the way a status speaks sometimes. And uh, I used to hear it in myself when I was a minarchist, when I would talk about the Constitution, mm. you know, and how it was like the Savior, you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Spooner got me over that. Uh, 45 minutes or an hour or so of Lysander Spooner, <laughs> the Constitution of No Authority. Right. And it was done like that. You know, you, you know the other thing that that I notice with volunteers, a lot of them is they're pretty humble people. Because I think you have to be humble if you're willing to put your previously held beliefs onto the altar of uh, logic and reason, and really examine them and say, you know, do I believe this because I was told to believe this or because it makes sense, right? And if you come across conflicting um, arguments, would you just shoo them away? because they don't agree with your previously held beliefs or are you really going to consider them because you want to be logically consistent? And I think a lot of anarchists exhibit that quality. Yeah, I've always been open to the idea that I could be wrong. And uh, there's been a lot of times, like my first six months as an anarchist, I was proven wrong hundreds of times, you know, because I still brought all out of this baggage and uh, uh, fallacies mm. and different uh, ways of thinking that, were had to be hashed out with these debates, you know. So I spent about six months to a year, you know, my first year just debating things mm -hmm. and being proven wrong over and over again. <laughs> and and I'm still open to the the idea that I could be wrong about anything I say. But when I do hear logic and reason, I know it when I hear it, and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, you know, you're right. <laughs> yeah, and and so I think um, the you know the constant the philosophy of voluntarism and anarchy is based. It must be based in humility because. It's basically saying that I don't know what's good for you, so how can I tell you how to live your life or, or um, you know, vote for an institution or empower an institution that will try to govern you against your will, right? I don't know how you should live your life. Most people don't even know how they should live their own lives. <laughs> so how do they expect to know how their neighbor should live their lives? Um, and and so I think, yeah, these, these philosophies are um, based in humility and, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. And what you just said was it really uh, is profound because 
when people think about it, like, you know, those, uh, like taxation is theft, voting is violence. That's one that I didn't get right away. I'm like, voting is violence. How is that possible? Mm. But then once I realized that, you know, you're enforcing the will of the majority over a minority who didn't consent to such, you know, things. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you know, a gun, there's, there's the threat of force, uh, which, you know, becomes actual force. And the initiators of that force are the ones in the wrong. And it took me a, a really long time to figure that out. But yeah, voting is violence, basically. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the first articles I wrote um, back in 2014. Oh, no, 2013, maybe. Um, yeah, entitled Voting is Violence for the uh, the Daily Anarchist uh, website. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, some people, you know, I think Spooner makes the argument like voting can be self-defense, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I, Rothbard I, made that argument too. Was it Arthur Rothbard? Yeah. Bro, I, well, they both made that same argument. Yeah. I would never, you know, if somebody asked me, uh, you know, Daniela, what's, what's the best way to improve the world? I wouldn't say vote libertarian. <laughs> you know, no. it's like, it's like, I have a whole list of things, you know, you know, raise your kids peacefully, you know, unschool, uh, start a business, uh, treat your friends with respect. Treat your, you know, anyone, everyone you meet with respect. <laughs> you know, um, agorism, all these things. Go down the line. Voting is, I, I, I wouldn't even say it. <laughs> I wouldn't even mention it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I would say that you know it's just it, it's it's more it's it's both it, it's all three of these things. It's a waste of time. It's ineffective, and the case could be made. It's immoral. Yeah, voting is violence. Don't vote for others. Uh, govern yourself. So I think everyone should run for governor of themselves. So, so I would that, vote for them. <laughs> so on that note, I, I assume you saw the entirety of the the uh, the Hillary uh, Trump uh, debate. I I saw not one second of it. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? I failed, but that's not because I wanted to see it. But that's because. I live in a house of people that want to see it. And so just simply me walking through the house, I catch, <laughs> I'm listening. My ear, I can't close my ears. That's so hard. I, I mean, I guess I could, but I didn't. <laughs> so I caught, I caught the poisonous words of these political predators seeping through my ears. And it was painful. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, and my, my wife was watching it. Like my wife, you know, she's. You know, she agrees with me a lot of the stuff I say, but she was still watching it, and maybe out of interest, I don't know, fascination. Um, but um, you know, it's like um, I, I compared it to like uh, if you're really good at something, I don't know, take something that you I don't know what you're really good at, like really good, like I love chess, I love piano, I do, you know. And, and so, if you're really, you know, expert in something, and you see somebody um, doing a his poor job of it <laughs> it's yeah. painful to watch you know mm -hmm. and uh and so that's kind of how it is it's like I, i'm so immersed in this stuff that that when i just see a politician speak it's like <laughs> it's like i don't know maybe it's in, in in a way it's like he's like a snake charmer trying to you know hypnotize you and trying to mesmerize your mind and <laughs> get you to you know just take his words on face value but Oh man, yeah, really painful, and I uh, did not watch it, and uh, well, not intentionally. <laughs> well, you probably could have tried to count the fallacies. Yeah, I don't that's, know. If, that's the other thing. I don't know if you're a drinking person, but you could just <laughs> every time they, there's a fallacy, you could just take a drink. <laughs> there's appeal to emotion, take a drink. Appeal to authority, <laughs> take a drink. <laughs> well, I don't drink, so <laughs> like maybe I could. I would drink kombucha. Maybe that. <laughs> I don't do that. There you go. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's uh, that's one painful thing that I will not subject myself to. That's torture in my mind. <laughs> it's like, it's like you, you know. I don't know if you saw the movie. Um, what's it called? Um, Clockwork Orange. Did you see that movie? Uh, I think I have. It's a long time ago, but yeah, a yeah, part I'm of a part, a part of the movie where they're like forcing his eyes open to, oh, to yeah. watch a movie. <laughs> yeah, forcing forcing anarchists to watch politicians talk <laughs> that would be torture <laughs> produce uh irreparable trauma and brain damage <laughs> right yeah i don't know if, like if you could actually program or brainwash an anarchist back into a statist to exactly. me it seems to me it seems to be a one-way road people that become anarchists after having been statists they don't usually go back 
Yes, that, that's, a, that's very true. It's often a one-way street. Although you do people cl- hear people claim to say that I once used, used to be an anarchist and now I'm a minarchist, like, like for example, Austin Peterson. Right, and then, uh, but well, then, you, then you really have to question, like, wait a minute. <laughs> I know a lot of people who say they're anarchists, but they're either saying it to be edgy or they're saying it to fit in, right? You know, or, or maybe they want to be an anarchist and they just don't know yet what that means. Maybe, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, gotta have compassion even for those people. Try to try to see again, see where you're coming from with that. You know, you know, because mm-hmm. because when I talk about this to some people that I meet. Um, and maybe new Facebook friends, and they're like, "All right, all right, so you hate the government. All right, so I'll get my guns. You get your gun. We'll go down to Washington D.C. And when do we start the revolution?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Stop. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm about. <laughs> oh, e- evolution, not revolution. <laughs> exactly. That's just the, that's just the initiation of more force. Exactly. And you know, force begets force, and we need to diffuse that whole downward spiral. Uh, so yeah." I'm all about, you know, peaceful, nonviolent resistance. Right. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm not about initiating aggression against anyone. Mm-hmm. So, like, any call for a violent revolution, I will not take part in. But uh, so, so you're saying I'm not going to see you at the next Black Lives Matter protest? <laughs> not necessarily. No. And, okay. and if I and if I am there, it's probably going to be to try to convince them that it's I know, not. Right? That it's not black versus white; it's blue versus you. You know, <laughs> it's like why are you like destroying this shop owner's window and stealing his merchandise? Is that is that going to fix any problem in your in neighborhood in some way, or or just you know destroy property that this guy built up? You know, <laughs> after you know a decade or two. <laughs> right, and it's like, what's Walmart got to do with it? <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, this and, is where I think you know, cell four one one and other kinds of things like private security and dispute resolution organizations would come in really handy because it's the monopoly on force that um, that the that the police kind of take advantage of, and there's no repercussion, there's no recourse, you know, when they initiate that sort of force against otherwise peaceful people, and so I think that you know, private security and cell four one one things like that could make the police obsolete. And I think that's more of the answer than it is to block traffic or smash Walmart windows. <laughs> yep, they got these Black Lives Matter. We got to send them to the broken fallacy window uh, <laughs> Wikipedia entry or something. Some oh, videos. Yeah. <laughs> the um, broken window fallacy. Right, right. Uh, bro- yeah, broken window fallacy. Um, the, uh, you know, why... You know, going down to Washington D.C. with your guns and everything—it's—it doesn't work. You know, it, it doesn't—it doesn't matter. You know, if you remove all the politicians, if you remove all of the, you know, the tanks and the soldiers and the military, and the, the, the you know, the IRS, it doesn't matter. That's the symptom of the problem. That's not the problem itself. The problem is not in Washington D.C. Right? The problem is in the minds of the people who believe that this is necessary for a civilized society, right? To believe that they are necessary because if you just remove them and the people still believe, they have this irrational belief in their mind, this status belief, they'll just create it again. It will mm-hmm. come back again, right? That's, you know, you got to get at the root, right? As a, as Henry David Thoreau, for every thousand people hacking at the branches, there's one hacking at the root. Yeah, I think that's just the, the belief in illegitimate authority and the lack of belief in your own authority. Like, you are the highest authority in your life, you know, and no one else should have authority over you. And I think once people stop, I mean, illegitimate authority is authority that you don't consent to. So once people kind of get wise to that game and become responsible for their own actions, I think, and, and it's not very hard to do. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the world could wake up and realize in a matter of a year or so. Right. But uh, yeah, that's that's really all that's really necessary, yeah. I think. Yeah, I remember what I was going to say is that you mentioned cell phone one, and I was also going to add um, Viper Threat Management Center. Ah, the business model. Yeah. Dale Brown, right. man. Mm-hmm. Doing yeah, some Detroit. Awesome, doing some Detroit awesome stuff. is doing wonderful things. And I think that's the whole – they cut off the government funding to Detroit and it started falling apart. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the free market figured out its own way to get those things fig, you know, finished. Like you don't necessarily need police to patrol, but sometimes you need to contract for security. Like either someone will you know, keep your house from getting robbed or show up when you call them to 
diffuse a you know, potentially violent situation. But you know, it's like the firefighters don't roll around patrolling looking for fires. You know? <laughs> so it's exactly. like, why do the cops have to patrol looking for for problems? Right, right. So yeah, yeah. we got to figure out who's the aggressor. Is it the guy? Is it the guy driving on the highway with a broken taillight, or is it the guy threatening his life for not pulling over because he has a broken taillight? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Who's the aggressor? Um, but uh, but anyway, so you know, wonderful conversation. So if there's anything that you want to finish up with, any last message you have for my my listeners before we go? Um, well, yeah, just uh, follow me on my Facebook page. Everything I post is public, um, so we don't necessarily have to be friends. But I do accept a lot more friend requests now than I used to. Uh, so you can find me on my Facebook page as well as a number of libertarian and voluntarist oriented Facebook pages that I help admin for, like anarcho-consciousness, psychological anarchists, uh, counter-establishment economics, the pull-out method, uh, the iconoclast, and also autonomous. And I'm also an admin of a group called Philosophy, Spirituality, and Anarchy. Uh, so you could try to join that group and uh, get involved in the discussions there. And uh, I guess you always ask for a quote, right? <laughs> well, you see, you beat me to it. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, usually, usually when people don't follow my show, and then and then they expect it, that I'm going to say bye, and I say I say give me a, give your favorite quote, and they're like, "Damn, you stumped me." <laughs> well, you <laughs> I usually do put people on the spot, and it's hard <laughs> to come up with you know a really good quote right there on the spot. Right. But um, my quote that I'm going to leave us with is the same one I had on seeds, and it is. Um, by a guy whose name I can't pronounce. Is it Etienne de la Buete? Or how right. do you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's it. So my quote is, Resolve to serve no more, and you are at once freed. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer. Then you will behold him like a great colossus whose pedestal has been pulled away, fall of his own weight, and break into pieces. And uh, that's the essence of the pullout method or right. agorism, you know. Um, instead of... You know, going through government, we can just pull out and avoid government and go around it. Yeah, yeah, basically the same uh, Buckminster Fuller quote, right? Um, you don't have to do what is it? You don't have to destroy a paradigm; just you know, make it obsolete by creating something uh, better. Yes, make it obsolete by creating a new one. Yes, yeah, beautiful. I love it. That's uh, that's the way. That's the that's the peaceful way. Make it obsolete, like Blockbuster was made obsolete. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Um, awesome conversation, Shane. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Really appreciate it. So, if anyone wants to uh, help out my show, you can do so through the links: um, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Patreon. The links are below. That's Patreon.com/slash Peace Anarchism. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. These shows are for free because I love spreading ideas, educating people. But, um, you know, my time is not free, right? There's always other things I can be doing. There's uh, opportunity cost to everything we do when you learn about economics. So if you enjoy the show, you find value, please trade value for value and uh, support me and make my wife happy. Um, <laughs> I love it. So basically, you vote with your dollars, right? It's the only vo that's the only voting I support is voting with your dollars, or you can vote with your feet. But in this case, vote with your dollars because <laughs> we're on the internet. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> or your bitcoins, or your bitcoin. Right, good good point. Vote with your maybe let's say vote with your currency or your or your money. Right, good point. Got to got to change that slogan there. Cool. Um, so oh, you can also go on my website and uh, click on the affiliate links. Uh, I'll have some uh, some books that we might have mentioned and you can uh, you, I get a small commission when you make your purchases through there at no extra cost to you so it uh, helps me do what I do best which is interview fascinating people like Shane here so uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for all the support everyone so this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and Thus Seeds of Liberty dot com and TheConsciousResistance dot com wishing everyone have a wonderful day take care bye Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.